we've all seen it before. One defendant gets six months in jail where another defendant will get 15 years in jail for committing the same crime. If you don't think local elections matter, then you haven't been paying attention. You're watching Access to Justice, and I'm attorney Delia Parker Mims. Today, we are going to speak with a local candidate for judiciary, the Judicial District 393rd. Is that correct? That's correct. Evan Stone, he's running for that position, and we're going to find out a little bit about Evan Stone so the audience can know who they could elect to be their representative in their local election. Evan, we're going to give you a chance to introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. Find out a little bit about who you are, why you wanted to run for office, and then we're going to go through sort of a, a litany of some questions so we could kind of get an idea of how you would look at things if you were someone were faced in front of your court or, or you had to make a decision. And I think perhaps this may be the only time I will get to ask you questions. <laughs> if you find yourself being elected, we'll, we'll have a revolt, reversal of roles. So I'm going to take a little bit advantage of that this Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Okay. All right, so Evan, you're running for the 393rd Judicial District. Tell us about that court itself. Sure. Um, the 393rd court is a district court. District courts in Texas are the highest level trial court in the state. They hear everything from felonies to divorces and tax collection cases, adoptions, car wrecks, lots of stuff. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a high level court. The 393rd currently is not assigned any felony cases. I believe the district clerks have decided that there are enough district judges to handle the felony docket in Denton County. So the 393rd is primarily a family court. About 65% of that caseload includes okay. family cases. So when you say it's the highest court in the area, specifically in Denton County, because in other cities, the district courts, there may simply be a family court for the district judge. Correct. And they may have a civil court and they may have a criminal court like in Dallas. But in Denton County, in the suburbs, where we do things big, our judges will, will have jurisdiction over all of those areas. Is that Absolutely, correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay. If, if our population grew large enough, they might finally start specializing the judges, but I don't think they have seen that need quite yet, though we are growing at a rapid, rapid pace. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to know is that you, you must be pretty smart and pretty comfortable across different levels of law, because in, in Denton County, as the district judge, you'd be responsible for the different areas. That's true. I would have to hear a wide, wide range of cases. Uh, when I started practicing, I was first in the federal courts. My focus was on copyright and trademark law, and I didn't deal with anything at the state level very much at all. Mm -hmm. And then when I dove into to state practice, yes, I realized immediately the, quite, the wide variety of cases that uh, I would have to deal with as an attorney in district court. Okay. Well, let's talk about you first, and then we're going to get into what I called my questions because it's going to be the last time I'm going to have the opportunity to ask you questions. Where, do you, where are you from, Evan? I grew up in San Antonio, um, and, but I've, I've lived all over. For a short period, I was a, a military brat, and uh, my father was a farmer, which led to some travel, which is not normal for farmers, but uh, I've lived in three different countries. Uh, I've also lived in California, which some people here in Texas consider another country. <laughs> it is a little bit different. It is. So when did you make it to the Denton County area? Um, in 95 is when I first moved here. But I, I moved away and I came back because Denton has that draw to it. And I, and I know many, many people similarly situated. Are, yeah. you, are you married? I am married. Okay. And you guys live in actually the city of Denton? We do. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So you're... You're local, you came back, you kind of like the, the Denton feel, and I now do. you, you, what law school did you go to? Uh, it's now Texas A&M School of Law, but it was still owned by Texas Westland when I attended. It was, it was transitioning after I graduated. But the, uh, they have invited me back to speak a couple of times, and I've walked around and realized that all the same people are still there. So just, they it's, just uh, changed the name, huh? They just changed the name and, and maroon washed it. Okay. But it's a, it's a great group of faculty there. Now, after you graduated from law school, did you open your own practice? Or? Uh, I did, um, almost immediately. Well, I, I spent some time working as in-house counsel for a local entertainment company, uh, Funimation Entertainment, and I still work with them. They're my largest client. They are, in fact, the largest motion picture producer distributor in the North Texas area, and that goes 
back to my undergraduate roots as a filmmaker. So. Okay. That was your major? Film? It was, yes. Where, was, did, you, where was did you do undergraduate at? Here at the University of North Texas. That's okay. where I studied film. So you're very much local. Yes. Okay. And you're back now at the University of North Texas today filming. So how does it feel to be yeah, home? Absolutely. Uh, it feels great. Yes. I like this campus a lot. Um, some great instructors here and a lot of really good experiences here. I was able to create a lot of neat stuff through the film program. So. Now, when I first met you, Evan, you had mentioned once about you were representing, you were doing some pro bono work, and you were representing a family, or it was sort of a family law issue. Do you recall what that was? Was it a court-appointed um, issue, or was it pro bono? I w I'm not sure which one it was, but you were talking about the, the, the if it that was a, type of family and the difference it is to go before the courts here and, and the need for oh, I think I know what you're talking about. Okay, because there was a there was a pro bono immigration situation I was dealing with around the same time, but this sounds completely different. Um, I think this was a, a a court appointed situation, which was not technically pro bono. The state actually paid my fees, but I, I have been appointed repeatedly by the courts to represent minors who are faced with the incredibly difficult decision of whether or not to be teen moms. Okay. Yes, and so in that experience, it kind of gave you the interest of, of wanting to be behind the bench. It did, absolutely. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, um, I believe very strongly in a woman's right to choose when to become a parent. And I also know that this state has one of the highest rates of teenage pregnancy in the entire country. Mm -hmm. and. The teens who I see become pregnant and become mothers at a very, very young age uh, don't always have a good time of it. It's, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. The system doesn't support them. It's hard to be a parent anyway. I have three teenagers, and um, I know how difficult it is for me as an adult, and I cannot imagine any of my children having children right now. Uh, but I've been appointed to represent young girls as young as 12 years old hmm. who um, they're human beings and they have the same instincts and impulses that we all have and uh, people get pregnant we have sex it's what we do as animals right. and uh, that doesn't mean you're ready to to become a parent so okay. I, I protect those people in those situations now we're going to talk briefly about your desire to become a judge and then we're going to go into some background questions that I have to so the viewers can get a better understanding of how you would look at things and um, make a better selection. So tell us what propelled you to, to throw yourself into the race? It was a few different things, Delia. Um, I, sitting around talking with my other attorney friends, you know, comparing notes about judges and trial experiences, we, we came upon a few realizations. One of those was that we could do better than some of those judges. Um, I'll be honest with you though, my worst experiences have been outside of Denton County. Um, situations where a judge just falls asleep on the bench. Um, that was in Chicago. Uh, but just the, uh, the realization that we could do that work and in many instances we felt that we could be more patient and more tolerant and more fair. And then the recognition that this city and this county is very diverse, but the judiciary is not at all. Okay. So you, in conjunction with your friends discussing this, decided to, mm -hmm. to throw your hat. And that's, that's commendable to have the courage to do that. Well, thank you. Um, it was a good friend of mine, uh, also a local attorney, who said, you, Evan, should run for judge. Um, that's, how the, that's how the conversation concluded. And I think he knew that uh, I valued his opinion, and if he said something like that, I would realize that it wasn't a joke. And he knew that I knew that if he said it to me, I would consider it a, a directive as well as an opinion. Okay. And uh, from there, it, it launched my campaign. And so how has your campaign been going? It's been outstanding. Uh, it's been a really wonderful experience. The people who have just appeared out of nowhere to support this campaign has been invigorating and inspiring. And I'm talking about all over the entire county uh, because we're everywhere. We're in Flower Mound and Argyle and Aubrey, Pilot Point, 
and people are coming out from everywhere saying they want to help us out, and then they are. They're coming to help us out, and uh, that has been incredible. So it's, the campaign has been really great. Okay. I'm going to go into now what, what I'm going to call the knowledge, character, and effectiveness set of questions. Okay. okay. Kind of put you under the hot seat. Now, Fair enough. if that day comes where I'm standing before you, <laughs> I'm going to hope that you have a little, you forget this moment, but <laughs> realize that we're just delving into how, how you would possibly think as a judiciary, which I believe the um, county, Ditton County people would like to know. Or, or I'll just be fair and do my job as a judge <laughs> and how give about you that? all the deference that you deserve as an attorney. And I, and I would appreciate that, and I'm sure my clients would as well. Okay, so. My first question to you is, do you believe the composition of the juries adequately and fairly reflect society at large? I do. I don't know if my experiences are unique, but I've never examined this as a data set. I only have my personal experience to go off of in terms of who actually makes the final jury um, from the jury pool. And in all of my jury trials, the juries have been exceptionally diverse in terms of both gender and racial background. Okay. And would that apply to Denton County as well? Have it you... would. Yes. Okay. Actually, some of the greatest diversity I see when I'm in Denton County has been in the juries. Okay. So. Good. If you became aware of unethical conduct on the part of a trial advocate in a case in which you were presiding, how would you handle that? I think I would ask for a private chat with the attorney in chambers immediately and have a very, very serious talk with that person. Um, I think that's the first place it has to come from, is from the judge, uh, even before the bar gets involved. And sometimes I think judges can help the bar from becoming involved if it's going there. Do you think judges have a, a responsibility to report? attorneys to to the bar um, the code probably addresses this and I and I need to look that up but personally even if that is what is in the model code I think that should be the judge's discretion I heard a very compelling argument on this topic when I was practicing in DC um, there was a judge who it was when I was first being sworn in in, in the federal district of DC he said, you know, you attorneys are hanging out around the water cooler comparing your notes on all of us judges. What do you think us judges are doing around the water cooler? And that stuck with me. That made a big impression. And he talked about the duty of candor to the tribunal and what a huge deal that is. And if you lose that, you, you've lost as an attorney. You can't go back and represent people in that court again if you have ever been dishonest with that judge. And I think that, um, or unethical in other ways, I think that's a big deal. And I think the judges have a lot of uh, influence over that and can keep people in line. Okay. So sort of the uh, attorney's own reputation is going to also limit them. Hugely. That's what I think I, I hear you I saying do as well. That. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that all citizens have adequate access to legal help in the, in the legal system? Sadly, I don't. Um, it's, it has grown so complex, I believe for good reasons. Um, you know, our common law system, trying to be fair, trying to accept precedent, which just makes the, the rules grow in complexity and uh, vastness, and lay people can't possibly master all of that. Attorneys don't even master all that. Judges don't either. So no, I think access to justice is, um, is not readily available and I think something needs to be done to help that. I mean, organizations like North Texas Legal Aid, I think, are outstanding. You actually worked with them for a while, didn't you? I did. I was the manager in the Denton okay. office. Okay. So I think that's tremendous that those exist. We need more entities like that. And you know, there's a large push by the, the Supreme Court and the bar to try to create more pro se information. Yeah. And more... Um, individual empowerment to be Absolutely. part of it. Absolutely. I love that. I've, I've actually, some clients who can't afford my services, 
even at severely discounted rates, because I really try to work with people, I end up giving them copies of things like the Pro Se Divorce Handbook that's put out by, I guess, the Tarrant County Young Lawyers. Mm -hmm. I give them whatever resources I can to help them do what they need to do if they really cannot afford representation. So, well, that brings me to a, a different type of question, kind of along the same line, though. As a judge, how would you look at those pro se applicants and handle them in court? Oh, uh, with sympathy and patience. I, but you have to draw the line somewhere. I've been in court, um, there was a federal magistrate in Colorado, I was before one time, uh, this was a federal toy counterfeiting suit, and the defendant was pro se, and this magistrate judge spent 15 or 20 minutes trying to teach federal civil procedure to this pro se defendant, and I thought that was a bit much. Um, but giving them the benefit of the doubt and helping them along if they are simply stumbling with procedure or stumbling with rules of evidence, I think that's fine. I don't think a person in that position should lose their case for a minor procedural error or a minor evidentiary error. So you would be pro se litigant friendly to a point? Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Now as a prospective judge, what do you consider your greatest strengths and weaknesses? I think my greatest strengths as a prospective judge are my background and the diverse experiences that I have had growing up. I think there is a real lack of that in the North Texas area. When I mentioned living in California, when I moved back to Denton from California, I was overwhelmed at how whitewashed Denton was. And uh, people who had never been out of the area, people who had never had any close connections with people of different backgrounds, cultures, languages. Very homegrown. Very homegrown. Very homegrown. And uh, I grew up in San Antonio. I, like, I, I, I'm, I'm used to some degree of diversity mm -hmm. and seeing that it's missing here is huge and I think that is a, a great strength as a judge because, well, I'm a judicial candidate now, to be clear. But if if you are the trier of fact in a case, mm -hmm. you need to understand the parties coming before your court. You, it, it helps you know when a party or a witness is being truthful or not, and it helps you decide what could be fair in that case for okay. people of that background. So that's your strength? I consider that a strength, okay. I do. What was your weakness? My weakness would probably be, <clears throat> but I also consider this a strength, uh, my weakness would be my youth. Uh, I'm 39 years old, and I obviously don't have the same legal experience that someone who's been practicing law for 20 years has. So uh, some people consider that a weakness in terms of just experience and knowledge of the law. But really, if knowledge of the law was all that mattered, then a robot could be judge. So right. it's, All right, now, it's a balance. What injustices have you witnessed in or outside the courtroom? Uh, I have witnessed, well, I already mentioned a judge falling asleep at the bench. <laughs> um, that is an injustice. <laughs> yes. And I have, I have seen, this was not in Denton County, again, I have seen clerks refuse to assign cases to certain judges because they knew that that judge's particular beliefs um, would prevent that judge from ruling fairly in a case. Hmm. And I think if a judge is so situated, they shouldn't be judge. Okay. Um, I mean, I, perhaps the clerk helped avoid the injustice by assigning the case to a judge who could, you know, just adhere to our Texas laws and follow the law and then fairly apply the law. Uh, but there are many situations where that right. doesn't come up until the case is already going and you've got a judge who just says, I'm automatically going to rule this way because of my beliefs, regardless of what the law says. And yeah. that is a grave, grave injustice. That is. Now, how do you deal with difficult people, including peers, lawyers, clients, litigants? With great patience. Um, I, uh, there are many uh, clients, especially, that I probably should have cut loose long before I did. 
um, with other lawyers, I try to kill them with kindness. Um, I mean, let's face it, lawyers can be difficult just as a species. We're our own species, right? I mean, it's, and I'm not gonna say it's superhuman, it's subhuman oftentimes. Um, but well, I think that, <laughs> I think the, the norm is that lawyers tend to be mostly helpful to other lawyers. And when they're not, it is an awful experience. My you experience, are right. I, I, it I, is I will, extremely awful when it's sure, a lawyer that sure. is not helpful. I think that by and large, the uh, opposing counsels that I have dealt with have been fair and straightforward and cooperative for the most part. Every once in a while, um, there there's a true snake out there and just keep it all in writing. But you're right, Be when patient. you come across that opposing counsel, that does make your life in that case more it exasperating, does. more so than the client being difficult. Very much so. Yes. Yeah. So patience, patience, and, and one thing one of my professors told me is always keep calling them by their first name and keep breaking that down. And <laughs> That's good. That, that That's a good tip. Them. Okay, Bob. Okay, Bob. Yeah. And eventually they'll. But you're right. That is, it's a terrible position when it's the lawyer that's being very difficult right. and all you can do is be patient and then go and adhere to the rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now what type of clients have you represented while you've in your practice since you've been in a career? Oh, quite a diverse set of clients. I've, I've represented a lot of large companies um, with hundreds of employees and numerous assets and I'm helping them protect just a small portion of their intellectual property portfolio. Um, I've also represented little people who are getting sued by big companies like that for infringing the, the big intellectual property portfolios of the big companies. And uh, I do, copyright law was my first love and I, and I like working both sides of those cases. It's a lot of fun. I don't like anything that is trying to stifle innovation or technology. But living in a college town, you you take on a lot more than that as far as clientele goes. I've represented numerous poor college students who are being railroaded by some unscrupulous landlord and I'm trying to help them get their deposit back or get rid of their black mold situation in their apartments. Uh, and then and family cases. I think simply because I know so many people. They, they have come to me saying, right. We've got you know a divorce. We've got a custody situation. We've got somebody who's not paying child support. Can you can you help us there? Okay. So, so what you're saying is you've kind of represented the spectrum from the corporations because as mm -hmm. a judge in the 393rd, you would be seeing some of that civil sure. litigation sure. courts. Corporations need a fair trial as well as anyone else. They do. And businesses and individuals, small business owners, as mm -hmm. well as perhaps disenfranchised people yes. who need a voice. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that covers a pretty large spectrum of, of people that you've dealt it, with. It does. It does. And the big difference there, helping out a corporation, you know, save a few thousand dollars or sometimes tens of thousands of dollars, you feel some sense of accomplishment, but it's not truly fulfilling. Um, when, when you're helping an individual, especially if you're making some meaningful difference in their life. I, I had a client once, this is a landlord-tenant case. She was in Section 8 housing and she was being evicted wrongfully. And I saved her from that eviction and we were awarded attorney's fees. And as soon as the judgment came down, she started crying in the courtroom, tears of joy. And I had a major shift in my focus of practice from that day forward. It, it affected me. I, it had been a very long time since I had made a difference that significant in someone's life. Th that is true. and. I have to say that over the last week, I received a, an email from a former client who was an abused person who years back and came back and said, thank you for representing me, helping that disenfranchised people. Yeah. Kind of like the ones you've mentioned before that you've represented mm -hmm. and the young teenagers who don't feel that they have a voice yeah. and have to go through this process that's intimidating by itself sure. and being perhaps pregnant is intimidating Absolutely. by itself. So it also helps to have a voice, at least someone listening to them, whether it comes out their way or not. Sure. A lot of times they'll come back and they'll tell you, thank you, you you heard me. I am. I had another client who we actually were not successful, but 15 years later she said, I remembered you because 
you listened to me mm -hmm. and you presented that to the court and you and I remember your closing argument. So I get that you you have that sense of understanding oh, of people yeah. who've been disenfranchised and at times simply need an advocate. Sure. And it looks like you've done that across the spectrum. I feel like it's 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 wide. I know there's a lot more out there, but yeah. Okay, well we're getting to the point now where we have what's called um, you'll get to have a final statement, a closing okay. argument, and I'm going to also throw in the last question that I was going to ask you that you can kind sure. of throw into that oh, in one okay. minute, which is why should voters consider voting for Evan Stone? Well, I think that voters should vote for me, Evan Stone, for district judge, to bring some diversity to the judiciary in Denton County. I realize that I'm a white guy talking about diversity, but what I'm referring to specifically is diversity of values, diversity of thought, and diversity of background. Our county is stronger when it's more diverse, and our elected officials need to be more representative of the electorate. Right now they're not, but you can make a difference. Okay, thank you. That diversity of mind that you're, you're bringing into this election, into right. this process. Okay, and having been raised in a different area, having traveled the world, lived yeah. in different places, um, that definitely does create a sense of diversity and understanding. And it's certainly been great having you come here today and talk with our audience. Thank you so, so much So we can get to know me. who you are, some of your value systems, and, um, and put that into whether or not that's the direction we want to go. And, uh, and I think you've done an awesome job today in explaining that Good. and explaining who you are. I'm happy to have the opportunity. Now I'm going to have what we call our closing statement or the final argument. I have to reserve that for myself. Sure. Again, and as I, I'm it's teasing, your show. as I'm teasing you, because this might be the last time I get to tease you, I'm going to take liberties and um, and do that. The election is November 11th, 8th. November 8th. Mm -hmm. I think October 8th, October 11th is the last time that we can register to vote. Yes. So you want to make sure that you have gone out, filled out your paperwork, and got registered so you can be a part of the process. I always like to encourage people to early vote, and that time period is October 24th through November 4th. Early voting is so easy to do, and you can early vote at any um, place in the county as long as it's in the early voting process. Now as we mentioned before, we've all heard the headlines of how there is a desperate difference of treatment of people in the court systems and with their judges. You'll see people being sentenced one, one amount of time and another person being sentenced an extraordinary amount of time for committing the same type of, of, of fraction. Local elections matter. You want to consider who you vote for in your local elections and consider who that young single mother will have to stand in front of or who that poor um, defendant who may not have adequate representation stand in front of. Vote. And for Access to Justice, I'm Julia Parker-Mims. Thank you.